title of today's message is The Eyes of Faith. The Eyes of Faith. I'm going to begin with a little story. You know, I had two pairs of glasses. These are new. Some of you noticed. They're bigger than I usually wear. Some of you never knew that. So, hey, I got glasses. Um, but I had two pairs, and both of them are gone within a matter of two weeks. Uh, big sad. My, my little son, he's one and four months. He broke one pair. He picked it up, and... Oopsie. The other one I was boating and the wind took care of that straight into the water. So that was fun. And so within a matter of two weeks, I lost both pairs. I thought I was good and set for a while, but here I am with new glasses. Look good, huh? Mm. Um, my wife picked them. So anyway, today we're going to talk about vision and, and faith. And all those awesome things. Let me just bust out my phone real quick. So without my glasses, my vision was a bit blurry. I couldn't really see the horizon. I can see really close. Like without glasses, I could still see Taras. But far away people, you're out of luck. I was building something on the roof and my father-in-law was like, is it this one or this one? I'm like, I can't tell. I don't know. So I need glasses to see far. Uh, what does that make me? Nearsighted, thank you. God, I was confused the two. Because I can't see far, but it's nearsighted. Like, what? Uh, oh, yeah, that makes sense. All right. Yeah, I just never think about it. Okay. Well, finally got a new set. And let's talk about this. Your eyes can be very deceiving. You know what? It's funny. I didn't talk to Taras about what I'm talking about, but he touched it a little bit. Because I was going to talk about the inner beauty and the outer beauty. And then our worship, I didn't really tell them what to sing. I didn't even know what they're singing, but we were singing about truly seeing and truly hearing. So that's kind of all the things we're going to talk about today. How do I make this thing stop turning on me? But sideways, whatever. Okay, so eyes can be very deceiving. Sometimes you can see something that is very, very beautiful or someone. Where's my NASA guy? Uh, but on the inside, they could be rotten or the, the thing could be rotten. And sometimes it's the other way around. Something is really beat up and ugly, but you see a lot of potential. Something is really simple, but you just see that it has this something in it that is just, you know, worth it. Uh, closest thing I could relate it to is real estate. Most people, I would say almost everyone, likes to buy a move-in ready house, right? Right? Because who wants to move out of their old place and move into a place that's not ready for you to live in? Nobody. Unless you're an investor. Then you make it work somehow and you invest. But how you do that is you look at the property not in the is state, but in could be state, right? Because is, is obviously not good. But when you think about what it could be, you're like, oh, yeah, I could make it real nice. Oh, it could be worth a lot. Oh, yeah, this is a good deal. And so you buy it. You don't buy it for what it currently is. You buy it for the potential or the thing you see in it. And so eyes can be deceiving. Sometimes you can buy a really nice move and ready home, and then you open up a wall, and oops, Burst pipe, everything's rotten, and foundation is sunk, and uh-oh, right? So your eyes can fail you. I know mine have. Your eyes can fail you. I want to remind you guys a story, a Disney story. Beauty and the Beast. There was a prince who had everything, and a castle, and an infinite amount of money, and, and he had these uh, dances, the ball, right? Everybody was dressed all nice and pampered. Have you guys seen the movie? It's a nice movie if you minus all the politics. There's politics in it. I can prove it. Um, so the point is the prince looks good. He has a beautiful castle, money, parties, everything you could ever want. It looks good. And then comes this, I don't know, what is she, a fairy of some kind? And she's pretending to be a poor beggar, right? And he just says, 
get get off my lawn, get get out of here. I don't want to see you. No beggars allowed. I don't know what he said to her. But this showed that though he is rich and though he has so much space in his castle, right? Though he has everything he could ever want, inside he is rotten. He's not good. He's not a helping and kind and compassionate soul. And so what this fairy does is she turns him into a beast on the outside, the beast that he is on the inside. Does that make sense? And she says, if you want to go back, you have to be pretty on the inside first, and then the outside will match. So that's kind of the Disney story that we, um, that we ran into. Let's talk about Jesus. When Jesus came to this earth, he was persecuted. People did not like him. Can you tell me who didn't like him? Pharisees, Sadducees. You know what's interesting about the fact that Pharisees and Sadducees, that they didn't like him? Is that they were the religious people. They were supposedly the believers. They were the people who, if you just look at them from the outside, their whole career is serving God. Their whole career is preaching, bringing worship and sacrifice to God. So when your eyes look, what do they see? Somebody that looks so good. Mm. They're dressed nice. They got these dangly ropes with dangly things on them. I forgot what they're called. Uh, they, they wear scriptures on their robes. They're, they're really nicely decorated. They're expensive, fine clothes. And what does Jesus say about those people? Somebody, come on. What does Jesus say about Pharisees and Sadducees? I'll read it to you. I ain't going to pick on anybody. Matthew 23, 27. Can we switch to NLT translation, please? Matthew 23, 27. NLT, New Living. Matthew 23, 27, it says the following, What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites? For you are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. What does he compare them to? A grave, a tomb, right? Uh, a casket. He says, you are so beautiful on the outside. One look at you and you're like, wow, perfect man. Must be a servant of God. Must be a holy man. But you look on the inside and he says, it's a dead man on the inside. It stink. It don't look good. Rotten. Rotten on the inside. And that's what Jesus called the religious of his time. I want to ask you a question. Why did Jesus speak in parables? Does anybody know what Jesus said about that? I like this one. It says, uh, Luke 8.10. Luke 8.10. Our screen's tripping. We'll fix it. You are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of God, but I use parables to teach the, uh, the, uh, the others so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they look... They won't really see when they hear they won't understand and so we come to a place where although these people who are religious who claim they know God who read the scriptures the Torah at that time right who read the prophets the people that should know God they are expecting a Messiah and when the Messiah arrives they don't recognize him does anybody know why that is? And I will tell you why that is. It is because we are the type of people that like to see before we believe. We must see. What did Daniel just read? I, was, I didn't tell him to read that. He read it. Uh, Luke 10, was it? 11? Um, they asked him for a miracle. They're like, yo, you want us to believe? Stop offending us. And he's like, oh, lawyers, you too. You guys burden people. Oh, you know what? Pharisees, you too. You guys are not letting anybody get saved. 
and though they saw, they didn't understand. Though they heard the parables, they didn't understand. It's because we as people, we want to see. And they were seeking a miracle. They were seeking a sign. They were like, if you are the son of God, then perform a miracle. Show us that you're a son of God. Even the devil said, jump off a temple or something, right? Uh, and, and the people on the cross were like, if you're a son of God, then come down off the cross, right? We love to see miracles. And Jesus is like, you guys want to see a miracle? I'll give you a miracle of Jonah. Three days in a, in a belly of the, of the whale or in a belly of the earth like Jesus he died for three days was buried so he's like yeah I'll give you a miracle at my resurrection that's it and he spoke in parables because he wanted people to dive into his words he wanted people to actually care about what he says Jesus's words were simple stories very very simple stories right I mean a man comes out to sow his field simple story Anybody understands. But Pharisee, to a Pharisee who already knows the scripture and you can't teach him anything. It's just another story. And it's no significance. But to a person that wants to hear and dives deep into the story and draws comparisons and parallels and seeks to understand, that person finds something valuable. That person sees more than the person that looks on just top surface level. Does that make sense? Jesus wanted people to go deeper. So we're a creature of sight. And we won't believe until we see. You guys want proof? John chapter 20 verse 24. John 20, 24 says the following. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it, believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound on his side. Jesus was stabbed with a spear. Eight days later, the disciples were together. Eight days later. And this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to, Tom, to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound on my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And then he said this, my Lord, my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. That is where I'm leading this sermon. How many of you have seen God? Blessed are you because you believe and you have not seen. Blessed are you because you have faith and you believe even though you've never seen. Because the people that seek signs and wonders, that's not what God is about. God never does an unnecessary wonder. God, God has you do all of your part first. Example, um, resurrection of Lazarus. Could have God moved the stone? But he says, remove the stone. And then he does the impossible. He resurrects Lazarus. And then Lazarus comes out and he's like, unwrap him. Couldn't God unwrap him? God only does the impossible when we have faith for the impossible. And everything else is up to us. So, how many of you think that Thomas might have seen a miracle of two, or, or two from Jesus? Or maybe, maybe more, Yeah? And yet he didn't believe. So it could be that seeing the miracle doesn't guarantee you believing. Hey? Remember when a man was, what's that story? A man was in hell and he's asking Abraham to get resurrected and save his brothers. And he's like, well, they have the scriptures. He's like, they won't believe unless somebody resurrects. And Abraham said, well, even if, some, if they don't believe the scripture, even if somebody resurrects, they will not believe. God wants you to have faith and to dive into his word. How does faith come about? Anybody? Faith comes by hearing louder. And hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you want to have faith, you need to dive deep. Because otherwise, 
it's just another story. It's just another parable. It's just a man out in the field. It's just a man doing this. It's just a slave threshing some, I don't know. That's it. It's just a story. You want a good, good night story or do you want to see God? Thomas, seeing the miracles, didn't believe. And maybe you think it's a one-off. Maybe you think, you know, it's just Thomas, you know. The unbelieving Thomas, like what we call him in Russian, Neviruchi Foma, or is that Ukrainian? Like, you call that a person that doesn't believe the obvious truth. You're like, you're such a Foma. <laughs> um, so this is like, one. you think maybe it's one-off, it's just one person. But I want to remind you a story of Israel. How many miracles did Israel see leaving Egypt? The plagues. How many were there? Like seven, nine? The plagues. And then um, crossing the Red Sea. How wild is that? How cool would that be? God defeated the greatest army in the world at the time for them with the water. And then they come to Mount Sinai. And I want to read it to you. Exodus chapter 32, verse 1. Exodus 32, 1. Second book. When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said. Make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So Aaron said, take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. All the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. When the people saw it, they exclaimed, O oh Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Aaron saw how excited the people were, so he built an altar in front of the calf. Then he announced, Tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. The people got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. After this, they celebrated with festing and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. Then Lord told Moses, quick, go down the mountain. Your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. How quickly they have turned away from the way I commanded them to live. They have melted down gold and made a calf. They have bowed down and sacrificed to it. They are saying, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. To that verse. If we keep reading, God says to Moses, I'm going to destroy these people. I'm done. I'm going to wipe them out of the face of the earth and I'll make a generation out of you, Moses. And Moses basically begs him not to do it. And God agrees. So it came to a point where God was ready to literally wipe out the whole nation. Because we are the type of people that want to see. Israel saw the miracle. They saw wonders. They saw tremendous things happen in their life, and yet they did not believe. They wanted to see. And I guess in a way, our eyes can become our own stumbling block because we always want to see and verify to believe. When God calls so simply, so humbly, so calmly, in such a gentle and calm, quiet voice, and just says, hey, believe. Come to me if you're burdened. Come to me if you're heavy. Just believe. And I want to remind you a story. Same story, same people, Israel. When the serpents were biting them. biting them, And uh, they made a cross with a snake on it. Uh, Moses did. And he said, anyone who looks at it and believes will be healed. Today, that is Jesus for us. If you look at Jesus and believe. You will be healed. You're saying, how can I have faith? How can I believe? Well, it begins with the scripture, right? We have established that. Faith comes by hearing the hearing word of God. And then, simplicity. You know, my little son, cute little guy, he um, was playing a game with me where I would come up to the bed, I would hold him in my arms, and I'd start leaning him back away from me. And he would realize there's a bed behind him and he would just fall. And uh, 
We did it a couple times. Then comes Roxy, and she has no idea I played this game with him. She freaked out because she just tried to jump out of her hands onto his back, onto the bed. She freaked out. She didn't expect it. Uh, she's like, what, what is he doing? <laughs> Why is he jumping? But that's the thing. God says, Jesus says, that unless you have a faith of a little kid, you cannot enter heaven. What does that mean? That just means that you trust God that much, that he will take care of you. You begin to take the steps of faith, and you just trust him to cover where, he, where you can't, right? Just trust him. And so the Israelites really wanted to see God. They so, so, so wanted to see God that they made a calf. God really didn't like it. Wanted to kill them all. Let's skip. Why couldn't they just accept Jesus? Why didn't the people of Israel at the time of Jesus accept him? You can't blame him for the fact that every time God moved in the past, he moved through some kind of military event. And so they expected the Messiah to be a military warrior leader. But God had a something else entirely in mind. And yes, he said it through the prophets. They should have known. But their eyes were closed because they thought they know. And they didn't believe the truth. And when Jesus came... They didn't recognize him. And this is the key verse I want you to get out of today. John 18, 36. John 18, 36. Fourth book of the New Testament. 18, 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. And that is like the crowning moment we were going to is that Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. By following Jesus, you're not guaranteeing that you're going to be doing good in this life. There's no guarantee. He blesses. He gives. He takes care. God, God is a God of provider. Let's remember what he did for Israel, how he provided for them. Their shoes wouldn't wear out. Food, food fell from heaven, literally. Poultry, the birds, they landed in front of their camp so they could just shoot and eat them, right? And water ran in a bare desert out of a cliff. If you know anything about water, it flows down, right? Well, what's it doing in a cliff? Uh, but God is a God of provider, and he takes care of you. But his kingdom is not of this world. This world belongs to the devil. He is the prince of this world. He is in charge. And what we ought to understand is that we cannot see this kingdom right now. We can in a way. We are his church. You are a faithful believer. You are his follower. But really though, heaven isn't here yet. And so we must take it by faith. Because blessed are those that cannot see and believe. And the encouragement today is simply for you to start developing your faith and to believe in God and to believe in the works he does and to start doing works for him. This is what the prophet said about Jesus in Isaiah 53, verse 2. I really like it. Isaiah 53, 2. My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in a dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his presence, nothing to attract us to him. It's almost like Isaiah is speaking from an apostle's perspective. Isn't that cool? Because he's a prophet. He sees the way people don't because God gives him this vision. And it's like he's speaking from a uh, an apostle's perspective and he's like you know honestly nothing really attracted us to Jesus he wasn't like really really handsome in any special way or like nothing really stood out that's what the scripture says right here nothing to attract us to him and yet there was something about the way he was teaching and something that he called him to do and 
This is what's really cool is that eyes can be so deceiving. Eyes can lie to you. And Jesus came as a simple carpenter, born not into a palace, but into a manger. He was not some kind of a warlord trying to overthrow a Roman Empire. He came to defeat something that is so much greater. Can I have somebody on keys? Yeah, thank you, brothers. He came to defeat something that is so much greater. Where is Rome today? Well, it's a city, but I mean the empire. No mo. Fell in two phases, 450 and 1450-ish. Western and Eastern empires. It's gone. And so if Jesus came simply to deliver people from the Roman Empire, well, it's gone. That would have been a very, very shallow goal, wouldn't it be? Just to deliver from some some kind of nation at the time. Jesus came to do something much, much, much greater. You see, in the beginning, God said, if you sin, there must be death. And God is perfect and he does not go against his own word and therefore there must be death. But he didn't kill you. He killed the animals as a sacrifice. And then he said, I will send a final lamb that will take upon the sins of the whole world upon himself. And so somebody did die for your sin. Somebody always has. In the past, it was the animal. And today, it's Jesus. And because Jesus is human, and he could die, and he's God, and there's so much of him that he can cover every single one of you and me, and the whole world. He has done something much greater than simply save us from some empire. He has saved you from your own sin. He has saved us from death. He has saved us from eternal suffering. He's done something so much greater than you and I could have ever imagined. Because they just, they just, the people, the people wanted to see the kingdom. And that's where I'm getting at, is Israelites, They were expecting Rome to be defeated. They wanted to see a physical kingdom being built. And Jesus said, that's not why I'm here. I am building something you cannot see. And people just don't believe what they don't see. That's how we are. But you believed. You believed. And God says, blessed are you because you haven't seen, but you believed. And as you continue to build your faith, that kingdom is already here in you. And we're growing that kingdom. And you can see glimpses of it. It's beautiful. It's called the church. But it's not there yet. We're not in heaven yet. And that's 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 where I'm that's like where I'm leading to is that there's still something we don't see, and it's that heaven. And it's God and it's Jesus. And there will be a day. There will be a day. Where you will stand before the throne. And the scripture says. Every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Every. And when scripture says every. I believe it's every. Right? Every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess. That Jesus is Lord. But blessed are you that have found him here on this earth. Blessed are you who confides in him and he forgives your sins because if you're outside of Jesus, you're paying for your own sins. But in Jesus, he paid for you. Outside, on your own. Inside, he paid you. He paid for you. Going back to the very beginning, vision. They couldn't see, and they didn't believe. Today, you don't see Jesus in a physical form. You don't see the heaven, but please, please believe, and it will come to pass. Because only the unfaithful seek some kind of evidence. And although there is a preponderance of evidence when it comes to Scripture and Jesus and the heavens, believe like a little child. And going back to looking beautiful on the outside but being rotten inside, that's me and you. 
and everyone on this earth. Jesus says, nobody is clean, nobody's perfect, not one. Everyone's a sinner. And him being this perfect creator, he saw the potential in you. Something that is beautiful on the outside, but rotten within. He saw the potential in you and he came to fix it. And today as we stand to our feet, as we stand on our feet, we're going to go into prayer. And as we pray, I want you to ask yourself, am I still doubting? Am I still looking for evidence or do I just believe? And if you're still doubting, it's okay, but are you looking for an answer? Are you diving deep into the Word or do you just come to a service and hear another story? Let today be a different day. Why don't you go home when you go home and open your scripture and begin to seek, begin to drink that water that is the scripture and Jesus says it'll make a source within you that will never run dry right the, the woman at the well he says if you knew what kind of water I could give you lady you could become a source within you and this is he's talking about faith let us come to God and build our faith let him ask him for faith and if you don't have faith that's okay but do look for it do seek for it be like that man that said Lord, I believe, help my unbelief.